KTN Prime. We don't expect anything less than a transparent election in this by-election. Back to the ballot. IEBC all set for seven by-elections. Judiciary Star Wars, what the JSC told Gladys Soleil. Who's planning to cheat? List of shame from exams body. And a helping hand at last. Hope for children with club foot. Captain Arobi, many thanks. Today is the 16th day of October 2013. Many thanks for joining us on KTN Prime. Of course, it's just a few hours to the by-elections in Siaya, Kibwezi, and Matungulu. We have our teams on the ground. They will be bringing us the latest from there. And, of course, joining us in this bulletin, bulletin at the bottom end of your screen is William Sila, our sign language interpreter. He's been with us since the beginning of the week. Of course, making sure that every single person can be part of this bulletin. Thank you for joining us tonight. Election coverage, by-election coverage for that matter, begins right now. In less than 10 hours, there will be by-elections in seven uh, places. That is, of course, in a county by-election for the governorship and in three constituencies as well as four county assemblies. Let's now take you to the big one in Siaya County where it is a battle for the governorship after Colonel Rasanga was bundled out through an election petition. KTN's Fred Omulo is standing by with the latest Okay, thank you very much, Ben Kitili. I am now here with the KTN team at the heart of Siaya County, and we are watching as, as the minutes pass by in preparation for tomorrow's by-election. The IEBC was putting the final touches to the by-election preparation. Materials were being dispatched all over the place, and right now, everything is, everything is in place as people prepare for, to go for the voting tomorrow. Now, there are six constituencies around here, and there are a total of 312,000 registered voters. We are talking about places like Bondo, Alego, Usonga. We are talking about Game. We are talking about Rarieda, as well as Ugenya and Ugunja. Alego, Usonga being the central constituency, has the highest number of registered voters at 151,000. And of course, the newly created Ugunja has the least number of registered voters at 79,000. There are 665 polling stations here in which voters will be expected to cast their ballots tomorrow. And uh, there are a total of, a total of 1,300 police officers who will be keeping the peace, who will be manning these police polling stations to ensure there is security. We also have polling stations off the, off the mainland in eight islands within the lake. Seven of these islands fall under Bondo constituency, and uh, one of them falls under Rarieda. We are talking about places like Wayasi, uh, we are talking about Ciro, places like Lolwe. And the materials have been already taken there by boat. They will be, the results will be relayed by the presiding officers from these islands, and they will be sending their results by phone because of the distance involved. By speedboat, some of these islands are about one and a half hours away. So it will take quite a bit of time if they are to get their results and then come by boat and deliver the results to the constituencies. So the IEBC has come up with a system whereby they will be, coming, they will be calling in their results before they come with the actual uh, manual results to be verified and then announced by the returning officers. We have three candidates who are gunning for the governorship right here. Of course, we have Cornel Amotra Sanga, the former governor who is flying the ODM flag high. And ODM, of course, is the most dominant party in this region. And it has uh, the highest number of supporters. They feel robbed by the loss that uh, came about as a result of the petition. Then we have William O'Duol of the National Agenda Party of Kenya. He had a very strong showing in the previous election. Rasanga had a, a total of 142,000 votes. 
and uh, William Oduol had around 133,000, bringing the total to around 275,000. It has been a very, very intense campaign here. The ODM team is led by the CR Senator James Orengo, and uh, the other MPs around this area have been chipping in, as well as people from far and wide. You're talking about people like Senator Johnson Muthama from Eastern Province. We are talking about people from Kisumu. They've all been coming here to campaign for Cornel Lamont Rasanga. Their main message has been that this is not a battle between Oduol and Rasanga as is, as is being perceived, but the real war is between, the real battle is between former Prime Minister Raila Odinga on the ODM and Quad side and the President Uhuru Kenyatta, who is on the Jubilee side. So these two people have been having a very intense campaign. It's, it's a little bit difficult to tell who is going to win at this stage. We also have uh, Dr. Noah Miguda, who is vying as an independent candidate. He is actually a former Nyayo House detainee. He actually served 15 days at, in, that period of, in that period immediately after the 1982 coup. And at that point, he relocated to Southern Africa, where he actually helped uh, parties like SWAPO, which is in uh, Namibia, as well as the ANC in their war for independence. After that, he then relocated to northeastern Europe, where he's worked in places like Denmark, Norway. The three of them are gunning for the governorship, and they are doing their best to convince the voters. Of course, the state of security is very tight. There's a very large administration pol police uh, contingent here, as well as the GSU, in case anything goes wrong. And that is, the, that is the state of things here in Siaya County. We are waiting anxiously to see what will happen tomorrow. I am Fred Omulo reporting to you live from Siaya County. Thank you, Fred. Katie and Fred Omulo, they are coming to you live from the county of Siaya, where in less than 10 hours from now, more than 300,000 registered voters will be going to the ballot in over 600 polling stations to just... Uh, find out who the next governor of Sia will be. Uh, we shall be bringing you the details, shall be bringing you all uh, the action from the by-elections tomorrow. Now, meanwhile, the by-elections have raised new questions about uh, the management of the country's political parties. Now, each of the candidates in the by-elections tomorrow got direct nominations from their parties without any room for a contest. Is internal democracy dead in all the political parties? Ketians Arono Cheng takes a closer look. Early Thursday morning in Siaya County, Matungulu and Kibwezi West constituencies go back to the polls after nullification of the March 4th results. It is worth noting that it is now over two decades since a multi-party system of political governance was established in Kenya and with it some measure of democratic space. Unlike other established democracies, though, instead of people being identified with particular political parties in Kenya, the parties are like suits which anyone can wear or discard at any time in pursuit of a political office. A political party in Kenya is a, a political shopping basket. And uh, that shopping basket has got its owner. That owner is uh, a tribal chieftain. And uh, there are people, usually psycho fans and other associated uh, ingratiating individuals and uh, some moneyed uh, persons who can also buy their way to the heart of the party kingpin. The nomination for Thursday's by-elections have once again displayed the lack of democratic space within parties. None of the candidates went through internal party elections to be nominated to vie. Look at uh, URP, you look at uh, TNA, and you find everybody trying to jostle to come around uh, the, the, the party leader, to come around uh, Mr. Ruto, to come around Mr. Kenyatta, to come around Mr. Odinga, to come around Mr. Kalonzo Msioka, because if they give you a nod, then you are home and dry. Despite constitutional and legal attempts to infuse political party discipline and strengthen party processes, they are still distinguished not by ideologies, but by personalities who lead them and their ethnic base. But the point is, when we have general elections or even by elections, parties ideally are supposed to give people a chance to nominate candidates who should be the flag bearer. So when they don't do that, they bring an element of dictatorship because who then decides who should be the flag bearer? 
if five people sit in a room and decide the flag bearer of a party, whether it's a presidential or, or gubernatorial election should be X and not Y, it limits the chances for people to also participate. Even as they go into the by-election, the major political parties are embroiled in grumbling by younger generation of politicians who want to host the older political kingpins whose word is law and whose hand-picked men and women almost always become the candidates. Aaron Ocheng, KTN. Right, so the question that is on everybody's mind forms the basis of a big question tonight. We're asking you, do you support the process used by political parties in choosing candidates in the by-election slated for tomorrow? Well, tell us what you think, uh, SMS, your yes or no response to the number 22155 and uh, make sure you tell us what you think and, of course, uh, you can also tweet us, Ben underscore Kiteli at Linda Ogutu and at Katie and Kenya shall be sampling those comments during this live newscast. All right, let's move on. Five former managers of the National Housing Corporation have been arrested by the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission of allegations of corruption. The five, including former managing director James Ruitha, were taken to Kilimani Police Station in Nairobi and are set to be arraigned in court tomorrow. They're facing prosecution for allegedly allocating themselves houses valued at millions of shillings during their stint at the corporation, which is under the Ministry of Housing. Others arrested alongside the former MD are the former company secretary Elizabeth Mbugwa, William Keitani, John Okumu and former manager Bernard Ogola. The scandal erupted during the tenure of the former housing minister Soita Shitanda who called in the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission to investigate the alleged illegal allocation of the houses. That is a story we are keeping an eye on for you and once it develops of course we'll bring it your way. Let's move to a briefing that caught the attention of a lot of Kenyans this afternoon. The Kenya National Examination Council has identified six counties it says have the highest potential to commit examination irregularities in this year's final exam. NEC Chief Executive Officer Paul Wasanga says Kisumu, Nairobi, Mombasa, Garissa, Eldoret and Mandera lead the park in facilitating cheating according to intelligence reports. Wasanga told journalists that security had been enhanced in all centers of of examination to ensure smooth running of the process and add all relevant education officials to abide by the examination rules and regulations. This year, 844,475 candidates, including 906 from South and Sudan, will sit for the Kenya Certificate of Primary Education exam, while nearly half a million candidates are registered to sit for the Kenya Certificate of Secondary Education examinations. This year to date, we have 844, 475 candidates registered for these examinations with close to nine, the 906 candidates from Southern Sudan who will be taking this examination. 2012, the exam candidature was 820, 255, which means we have seen a growth of 25, 24,220 or close to 3% growth in candidature of KCPE. Well, you can be sure that, of course, NEC will be following up, so be warned. Now, this being Wednesday, it is a day for Jeff Kwenange live. And let's now take you straight to the Intercontinental Hotel where Jeff Kwenange is standing by to just uh, tell us what to expect in the show tonight. Jeff? That's right, Ben. If it's Wednesday, you know it's the bench reloaded. High above the CBD on the rooftop of the Intercontinental Hotel. And Ben, if you missed last week's show, well, you better take a seat, sit back, because today we're gonna to be talking about the state of the nation. Everything from devolution to VAT to insecurity, and yes, the big gorilla in the room, and I don't mean Dr. David Matsanga, Ben, I mean the ICC. We have a great lineup of guests today. Barack Maluka, everybody knows he's the man from Emmanuelia. He knows what he's talking about, and he's going to be breaking it down. And also, the Ungwana man himself, Ken Jiru, talking about some of the Ushenzi things that our leaders are doing out there, talking about the Shabeshans and everything that surrounds that. 
It's going to be a great show tonight. Everybody, get tweeting. My hashtag, my Twitter uh, handle is at Koinanga Jeff, and the hashtag is JKL. Let's get to tweeting. Let's hear what you have to say because this is interactive live in about 50 minutes or so. Ben, back to you. Thank you, Jeff. That's Jeff Konanga coming to you from the Intercontinental Hotel, where, of course, shall be expecting in about 40 minutes' time to be coming to you with Jeff Konanga live. Remember to join that conversation on Twitter. The hashtag is JKL. And of course, part of what uh, Jeff will be discussing is democracy. How far has it gone? And uh, are political parties really observing the political process? That formed the uh, basis of our big question tonight. And we are asking you, do you support the process used by political parties in choosing candidates for the by-election slated for tomorrow? Let us know what you think. You can tweet us at KTN Kenya, at Ben Kitili, and of course at Linda, Linda Gutu. We will be glad to sample some of your views during this and then as you prepare to <coughs> give us your views on that, remember it is a question that has been raised, uh, has been concerned, con has concerned many Kenyans, of course, in the way the political parties have been choosing these particular candidates. Remember tomorrow there are those seven by-elections scheduled uh, to take place. So what? just remember, make sure you tell us what you think. Do you support, that is a question, do you support the process used by the political party you support in choosing candidates in this by election that is for tomorrow. The SMS line, as always, is 22155. All right, so earlier on, we spoke to... Uh we spoke to our reporter who is uh, keeping an eye on what's going on in Siaya for us. Let's now turn our focus to the Matungulu by-election. Of course, the residents there will be making a decision on just who will be the next uh, member of parliament. Of course, you have three candidates trying to figure out uh, if any of them can get that seat. And of course, a lot of political analysts seem to think this will be the deciding factor. And it, it will actually be a look at how political parties are in play in this and just how powerful the Wiper Democratic Party is uh, currently uh, faring in that region. Let's bring in Samogina. He's been looking at the scenario on the ground for us. Uh, let's find out what's going on on the ground. Sam. Thank you so much and welcome. We are coming to you straight from the streets of Tala Town, Matungulu constituency. And here over 47,000 voters will be trooping to polling stations to cast their ballots in less than 12 hours. Now voters return to the ballots after the High Court nullified the election of their area MP, that is Steven Mule of Wiper Party, on account of that is uh, electoral malpractices. Now, voters that we are able to speak with in this town actually were of high spirit, saying that they are going back to the ballots to elect a transformative leader. Tutawanyesha sisi ni wakamba. Maendeleo ni kitu ya maana sana. Watu wamekuwa wakija, wakiomba kura zetu na wakienda makwao. Wakienda, wanaenda, wanashiba wao wenyewe na waongei mambo ya zile barabara walikuwa wanaomba kura nazo. Now the contest here in Matungulu constituency is between the immediate former MP, that is Stephen Mule of Waipa Party, who will be voting at around 11 in the morning, and Thomas Musao of the New Democratic Party. Equally in the race, the third candidate is Moffat Muya of the, that is the NAC Party, a Jubilee Alliance affiliate, and he will actually be casting his ballot at around 7 in the morning. It was a busy schedule for the electoral body, the IEBC, as it was putting final touches to beat the deadline of transporting electoral materials to the 117 polling streams across the 101 polling stations in the vast constituency. IEBC officials here exuding confidence of a smooth exercise despite having suffered a credibility dent in the numerous election petition cases. We will not be expecting long queues because our equipment have been tested, they are working, they are in good or perfect condition, and therefore even the identification should take us 
short as a minute to a maximum. Uh, this is an open exercise. Uh, IBC has always done open exercises. We don't expect uh, anything less than a transparent election in this by-election. Uh, and we are very confident, as usual, to test our systems. We are rectifying where we thought uh, things were not working before. And this informs our next step to ensure future elections are very credible and transparent. Well, on the other hand, security has been scaled up here in Matungulu constituency ahead of the poll exercise tomorrow with the IBC bringing on board over 254 security officers drawn from the administ administration police unit uh, to keep vigil and man the various polling stations. And at any one time, there will be at least 20 security officers manning the main tiling center, that is the Tala Catholic Church Social Hall. We have engaged the security officers, 254, and the 351 polling clerks. All preparations are complete. Polling stations here open at 6 in the morning and close by 5 in the evening. Being a weekday, IABC has urged employers to allow their employees time to go out and cast their ballots before returning to their normal duties. I am Sam Ogina from Matungulu Constituency and will keep you updated and posted on the events that unfold here on Election Day tomorrow. Who will be the best man who will be the groom in Matungulu? Is it Mule or Maida or Musa? Stand by. Uh, keep it, Katie, and Sam Ogina will be bringing us that report tomorrow during that by-election. Remember, we also have uh, Asha Mwilu in Kibwezi West. In other news, a new battalion from the Kenya Defense Force is taking over from the one that has been in Somalia as part of the Amisom troops for the last one year. The outgoing troops left the war-torn country with the incoming troops already on the ground. The troops were integrated into Amisom a year as part of a new mission to stabilize Somalia as well as wipe out the Al-Shabaab. Bags packed all lined up to board their flight back home. Kenya Defense Forces serving under the African Union mission in Somalia, AMISOM, have ended their tour of duty and are being replaced by a new battalion. These officers have been in Somalia for the last one year, serving alongside other African troops from Uganda, Burundi, Djibouti and Sierra Leone that make up the peacekeeping force in the fight against the Al-Qaeda linked group Al-Shabaab. I'm very proud of my officers and men uh, who are going out because we have at least gone so through quite a number of uh, challenges but we have surmounted them. Kenya Defense Forces entered Somalia in October 2011 to fight the Al-Shabaab, which had caused a menace right inside Kenya. A year later, they were integrated into AMISOM to continue the security mission aimed at stabilizing Somalia, a country that has been rocked by conflict for over two decades. At least every day, we send patrols uh, around the town, and it's very evident now that uh, uh, normalcy has returned in the town. Because you can see the villagers are moving freely, uh, they are doing their businesses. Amisom troops have so far forced Al Shabaab out of major cities, including Kismayo, a major economic hub that was under Al Shabaab control. The militia used the lucrative port as a major source of revenue for its operations. The officers under Amisom say the security situation has greatly improved and there is relative calm in several towns. Angel Katuse KTN. All right, let's now bring in my colleague Asha Mwilu, who's keeping an eye on uh, the by-election that is expected to happen tomorrow in Kibwezi West. Of course, there are three candidates there, uh, and uh, the number of registered voters there stands at about 54,000. Let's see how the situation is like on the ground. Asha. To you, we have pitched camp at Kibwezi West constituency ahead of the by election tomorrow. In this constituency, it will be a three horse race for the seat to represent the residents of Kibwezi West in the National Assembly. Those candidates will be on the ballot paper that is Kalembendile of Tip Tip, um, Juliana Mumo, who is representing the PIC um, party, as well as party independent um, candidate. These are pictures from earlier on in the day, and that is Kibwezi Technical Institute um, Training College. This is the main tallying center 
of this constituency and it's also the headquarters. Today those are final preparations that were underway in this constituency ahead of the poll tomorrow with polling clerks coming to collect their polling material for 164 polling stations where up to 54,881 registered voters will be going from 6 a.m. up to 5, 5 p.m. in the evening to cast their vote to elect their representative in the National Assembly. We did also see a heavy patrol of security officers that will also go to all these polling stations and later in the evening come to the Tallinn Center here in Kibwezi uh, near Makindu just to make sure that security is uh, is tight and is sec and the place is secure. Um, we do know that this by-election was occasioned by a petition that was filed by Kalem Bendile earlier on. Justice David Majanja at the Machakos Law Courts found that there were malpractices in the March 4th election. He did, re he did order for a recount in that poll and found out that um, Kalem Bendile did lead by up to 80 votes against Patrick Musimba. Um, IEBC Commissioner Mohamed Alawi, who is in charge of this constituency and will be here um, keeping track of what's happening in the poll tomorrow did speak to us earlier on in the day and this is what he had to say the exercise of this magnitude will always have challenges yes we had our challenges we have surmounted them so where we are now we are not forcing any 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 hiccups we have two systems that work together we are going to use the electronic system that will be promptly after the counting and the results will be re relayed here and they'll be also on the in our internet uh, in, in our website for anybody to see and they're actually pinpointed where they are coming from. In tandem with the constitution, there was no campaigning today as yesterday was the last and final day of campaigning here and residents today were only gearing up and getting their electoral cards ready for that exercise that will kick off tomorrow morning. Of course, we have to go and get some night sleep and we'll catch up with you early in the morning as early as 6 a.m. when Kibwezi West will be going back to the poll to elect the member of the National Assembly to represent them. Back to you in studio. Thank you, Asha. Asha there in Kibwezi West. Remember, Samogena is in Matungulu. And of course, Fredo Mulo is in Sierra. Three uh, by elections which were occasioned by election petitions. Of course, we shall be bringing you the latest tomorrow, plus four other by elections in county assemblies across the country. And if you're watching KTN Prime, thank you for staying with us this far. We're taking a short break. Stay with us, though we have lots more coming your way. You're watching K10 Prime. Stay with us because just ahead, we tell you where club footed children can get free surgery. You're watching KTN Prime. Back to KTN Prime. Thank you for staying with us. Now, the Chief Registrar of the Judiciary, Gladys Boss Sholei, began her defense before the Judicial Service Commission with questions over the Commission's jurisdiction to probe her. The Commission, however, ruled that it had a constitutional mandate to provide oversight on the Chief Registrar's performance. Sholei has been accused of procurement malpractices, among other allegations, but she denies any wrongdoing. The hearing with which the JSC insists must be held in camera continues Friday. The Judicial Service Commission ensured that the media was effectively barred from the corridors of the Supreme Court of Kenya, where the Chief Register of the Judiciary, Gladys Sholei, had been summoned to answer to allegations of misconduct and abuse of power. This was after the Commission rejected Sholei's plea to defend herself in public. But when the Registrar appeared before the Commission in the morning, she was not ready to answer claims made against her before certain issues were clarified. Through her lawyer, Donald Kip Korir, Sholei said the Judicial Service Commission does not have jurisdiction to question the registrar. Kip Korir said under the Constitution and the Public Finance Management Act, the registrar is the accounting officer of the judiciary and is only answerable to Parliament, Auditor General, Public Procurement and Oversight Authority, and the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Authority. Kip Korir added the Cabinet Secretary for Treasury can ask any of these bodies to act. In her defense, Sholei said she was entitled to impartial hearing, right to public hearing, and that the process must meet the minimum threshold for administrative action. Sholei said the Commission's power in disciplining the registrar is only residual and or referral from Parliament, the anti-corruption body, Auditor General, and or Procurement Authority. Lawyer Kip Korir asked the Commission to also inform the registrar whether the process was investigatory or disciplinary. In their response, 
The commission that was chaired by Chief Justice Dr. Willy Mutunga held that they have jurisdiction and that they will act as a corporate body and therefore personal bias or impartiality will not arise. The commission also said the proceedings are disciplinary and will continue being held in camera. Yes, I am here to confirm that uh, proceedings regarding the Chief Registrar of the Commission started today and will resume on Friday. But it is just not clear yet whether Gladys Cholet will be ready to answer to allegations leveled against her. Even after they adjourned the proceedings, the drivers of the Chief Justice and his security engaged the media in mind games on where the boss was to board his vehicle, maybe to ensure an in-camera boarding. Patrick Amimo, KTN. Let's take you to the North Rift now. And a few days ago, we brought you the story of a young lady who had spent a good part of her life dealing with a condition known as clubfoot. Many parents tend to hide the children when they discover this condition. But now there is hope somewhere in the North Rift, a hospital that treats the disease completely and does it for free. As Belcheruto is a bright class for people, always taking the number one slot in school exams. She looks from a distance at her fellow pupils playing, desperate to be part of the game. She can barely play. The pain in her feet sometimes too much to bear. Asbel has club foot, also known as congenital talipes equinovarus, is a congenital deformity involving one foot or both. The affected foot looks like it has been rotated internally at the ankle, Without treatment, people with club feet often appear to walk on their hyperlink ankles or on the sides of their feet. Could be uh, just idiopathic. It can just come out of the blue. Club foot is a relatively common birth defect occurring in about one in every 1,000 live births. It occurs in boys twice as frequently as in girls. Asbel can hardly take pleasure in wearing shoes. In other people in the same school, Emmanuel has the same condition as Asbel. Shida pia ni ile ya kiatu. Awaja kuwa na viatu ya kutumia inye inawafa. Sasa viatu vya uwa inaisha araka. Mesunguka nae. Kutoka wakati alisaliwa. Mzai Kibet has brought one of his grandchildren for a checkup at the hospital to undergo surgery. Something he did not realize could have been treated at an early age. It can be hereditary, so you can have it running in families. There is no single known cause of club foot, and because of the lack of knowledge, some communities consider it a curse to bear a child with club foot. Rift Valley has an estimated 500 kids with this challenge, and according to Dr. Lilei, 1,653 children are born with club feet in Kenya annually, a majority of them from poor families. We manipulate the foot to the correct position and then put a plaster of Paris. Um, and we do that, we repeat that every week. And uh, we progressively correct the deformity. <laughs> Parents have been called upon not to hide children with this condition as it can be treated. Although some hospitals charge between 100,000 and 200,000 shillings for surgery on club feet, St. Luke's Orthopedic and Trauma Hospital in Eldoret sources for funding from donors in order to offer this surgery for free for all children brought here with a challenge. Zipora Karani, KTN. There is hope indeed. Let's stay in the Rift Valley now. And former President Daniel Arap Moy has called on the private sector and the government to work together with universities and take the lead in applied research. Speaking earlier today at the Kabarak University, during the official opening of the third annual Kabarak University International Conference, Moy noted that the spirit of information sharing among national agencies is one thing thus slowing down innovation and industrial performance. Moi urged Kenyans not to rely on foreign innovation, but take part in inventing ideas that would contribute to the growth of the nation. He also advised Kenyans to shun tribalism. for a purpose, to improve lives of our people and to move ahead like other nations. 
We have got brains like any other fellow, black, white, or whatever you. Why don't, why can't we not do it? Let us not talk um, about little things around us. Let us talk about big things. Work hard in innovation, in improving our own economy to feed more people. All right, so the government has opened itself for business, and of course this will include women, youth, and the disabled. Boni Tunya has the details in business news coming right up. Boni. Right, there's a lot of business news involving governments today. The Kenyan government has done exactly what you've said, but we also know the American government has a deal now, and they'll be reopening business soon. Government made accessible women, youth, and the disabled anticipate the 30% procurement rule. Good evening, my name is Boni Tunya, and this is business. The Kenyan government has opened itself for business with women, the youth, and the disabled, marking its first in 50 years. Now, this is expected to economically uplift them by preserving 30% of all state procurement services. Adelaide Jangoli attended the opening of the exhibition held to showcase what's on offer by the government for business and brings us this report. For far too long, we have ca characterized our, our women as people who are dependents. We want our women now to become people who we depend on. Yeah. We have ca characterized our youth as being people with no vision and with no direction. We want to consider them to be the engine and the energy of a new Kenya as we move forward. The President's words underscore the new breed of traders that are pulling all the stops to get a foothold into the country's thriving business sector. And their prize, the 30% of government tenders reserved for women, youth, and people living with disabilities. My name is John Dolo. I am 20 years old and I sell armored cars. For Dolo, the journey started at the beginning of this year when he decided to venture into the hitherto untapped market, armored cars. Since then, he has tried to get a foothold into the market with mixed success. I went online, checked out a few companies that do this kind of business, and I emailed them, asking them to give me a contract to be, to be their supplier in the country, and, all that, and they accepted. So far, his biggest drawback has been his age, with many dismissing him as too young and inexperienced. And this has seen him become victim of unscrupulous government workers who have tried to coerce kickbacks from him so they can get him through to the right offices or into the procurement system. Because I had such an experience earlier, I will not mention where, but the person wanted 20% of what I will make. As such, he is lauding the decision by the state to set aside 30% of all government tenders for youth, women and people with disabilities. We want this to be something that is real, as has been said. CO2 Kusema tunataka kuwapatia nafasi zile za kukata nyasi au za kuleta samusa kwa ofisi hiyo tunataka wapatiwe nafasi across the board and the head of state is encouraging officials in state departments not to dismiss the youth who lack experience saying that experience can only be acquired if they get the opportunities to learn the tricks of the trade wacha ajaribu Kama hata faulu safari ya kwanza, mpatie na fasi. Safari ya pili, ya tatu, he will be the best that you will ever have had or gotten. Adelaide Changole, KTN Business. Now, fighting corruption is fast becoming present to Huru Kenyatta's key talking point, at least going by the recent statements. Now, in his latest approach, the president says he will launch a website where corrupt state officials will directly be reported to him. Joseph Bonyo puts this into perspective. Corruption in the public service has over the years remained a key obstacle in service delivery. Right from the low cadre of government offices to key departments, the plague has been ranked as one of the curses of public service. But it now seems President Uhuru Kenyatta is seeking to counter it head on. Mimi nitafungua myself a website and a web page. Where? 
wewe ukienda kutafuta kazi kwa wizara au kwa parastatu ukute mtu ambaye anakuambia mimi nitakupatia hii ukinipatia hii wewe ha? wewe kazi yako ni kunyamaza ni kukubali uende pale e, 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 bureau pale ile ile ya, ya, ya kuna internet hapo hiyo kitu ambaye nitatangaza hivi karibuni uweke jina ya huyo mtu uweke wizara uweke department yeah. alright hakuna faida ya uweke jina yako yeah. wewe ya yule ambaye aliagiza hiyo pesa na ni pesa ngapi huko kuingine mtu achie sisi tufanya kazi yetu The website it is hoped will give Kenyans to a chance to address corruption with the highest authority in the land and by extension give confidence to the public in the war against graft. According to the annual Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, Kenya at the end of last year was still perceived as a corrupt country both globally and in Africa. In the index, Kenya was ranked number 139 out of 176 globally. While in the East African community, despite being the largest economy, Kenya ranked as the second most corrupt country after Burundi. It is this tide that the president is now keen to turn around. One of the things that kills us as a society, as a nation, again is the issue of corruption. And we are constantly addressing ourselves to this issue. Please let us now be more practical. Globally, the fight against corruption has failed in countries where the lack of political will and the slow pace of reforms in critical sectors exist. In Kenya, it was initially hoped that the passage of a new constitution in 2010 would help in dealing a blow to graft, but little has happened. However, for the fourth president of the Republic of Kenya, this will no longer be the order of the day. My government will not tolerate corrupt public officers. I expect all public officers to abide by the guiding principles of leadership and integrity, which include selection on the basis of personal integrity, competence, and suitability Joseph Bonyo KT and business Well Safaricom cut its carbon emission by 12.69% over the period ended March this year following a drop in the usage of electricity diesel consumed in the generators and the refrigeration gases according to its latest sustainability report the company used 31.77% less diesel in generators or just about 5.74 million liters last year compared to 8.42 million used over the previous year now as a result safari uh, carbon emissions fell by 12.69% to 61,342 tons over the period ended March this year from 57,420 tons emitted over the period ended March last year. Elsewhere, Orange Kenya has launched a wireless fixed voice service targeted at households and small offices. The prepaid service dubbed Home Talk, the operator says will be provided via a plug and place desktop phone at one time device that will cost about 4,500 shillings. Now the new service is part of the company's transformation project that will also see it revamp its fixed line services across the country. Right and just before we give you the numbers we have some breaking news coming all the way from America is that the Senate has announced a bipartisan deal that will allow a reopening of the US uh, government and this has been announced of course by the Uh, Senate ma Democratic majority leader that is Harry Reid that there is finally a deal and the American government will indeed be reopening talking of matters reopening let's look at how the markets reopened on Wednesday business in association with Safaricom Business open new opportunities with the website and professional email address 
To get access to a free website builder, visit cloud.safaricom.co.ke. That's just all the business we had for you today. For me, it's good night, but I live in the safe hands of Linda Gutu. Bonnie, thank you very much for watching KTN Prime on this Wednesday evening. Here now is a recap of the top story we are covering for you tonight. Voters in Siaya, Matungulu and Kibwezi West are preparing to go to the polls tomorrow in by-elections occasioned by election petitions. In Siaya, more than 312,000 voters are registered to take part in the election of a new governor. Cornelius Rosanga, who lost the seat through a petition, is being challenged by William O'Dwell of the National Agenda Party of Kenya and an independent candidate. Noah Wynn um, voters in Kibwezi West and Matungulu constituencies will also go to the polls to elect uh, new members of parliament. The Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission will also conduct similar elections in four county assembly wards in different parts of the country. Of course, our reporters on location say preparations have been finalized for all seven by-elections. Let's see how that goes. Of course, we'll cover it for you. You're watching KTN Prime. Many thanks for staying with us. Remember that uh, story, of course, is the basis of a big question. We're asking you if you support the process used by the political parties in choosing the candidates in the by-elections. Keep telling us what you think. We'll now take a short break. Don't go too far. Much more coming up shortly. Coming up in sports, Gurmahia smell their title after victory in Thika. A story of two lovebirds who decided to wed in an ambulance. You're watching KTN Prime. Welcome to Sports Start with the Kenyan Premier League as it enters the business end of things and everything is going according to plan for Gormahia. Bobby Williamson's charges defeated Thika United two goals to one to inch ever closer to their first Premier League title in 18 years. But the rush to the title was slowed by Sofa Parker's whip uh, of Chamalil Sugar two goals to one to ensure Gormahia do not widen the gap on top of the KPL table. No other Premier League coaches remain cagey on Gormahia's chances. Thika United's John Kamau boldly declared Kogalo, the champions in waiting. Ketians, Hassan Juma was in Thika and files the following story. Thika United's coach John Kamau believes the title is Gurmaya's to lose. After his side, Thika United was unable to mount formidable resistance to the champions in waiting. The traveling Green Army came in their droves. displaced their horse as they took over the VIP dais and pushed their horse to the periphery. As they chanted the now common phrase, Giniwese Kao, which means we have taken this thing, referring to the league trophy that has eluded them for the last 18 years. Even the bumpy pitch could not stop Bob Williamson's charges as they controlled possession and stifled the midfield. Tekka United were merely chasing shadows at home. Gormaya got their opener in the 19th minute as Kevin Omondi's cross found Edwin Lavazza. And Eric Cheng merely applied the icing. If Fugalo's opener was classy, the second was top drawer. As Ugandan import Dan Serenkuma's solo effort after being released by Joseph Fanyoni put it beyond Tekka United's reach. <laughs> Dennis Odiambo's penalty was too little too late to change the course of the match. And John Kamau could not help but throw in the towel. Na kombe ni lawa poteze, so mimi sijui vile watacheza huko kuingine, so ningetaka kushugulika pia na vile tutaendelea kucheza game hizo zingine ine. His opposite number created the 12th man for the team's success. Uh, these guys have shown great concentration. Unfortunately, like you see the penalty late, but we got the result we were looking for. In Mombasa, Bandari condemned homeboys to relegation with a 2-1 win. Alibai opened the Dockers account in the 17th minute from the spot. Maurice Odipo made it 2-0 for the hosts. Homeboy's all-important goal was notched by Tony Setongo in the 84th minute, but was too little too late to salvage anything for the relegation candidates. In other results, AFC Leopards won the Western Derby 2-1 against Western Steamer. Svapaka bugged all the three points against Tamil Sugar. Bankers KCB thumped Sony Sugar 3-2 as defending champions Tusker's miseries continued in the barren draw against Madari United. However, it's Gormaya's charge that seems unstoppable. And as chance died down and the Green Army left the camp, Tulsa mount a tangible resistance against Gormaya.
All the whole sticker United expected would give Gormahi a run for their money. But that did not happen. Instead, the Green Army took over the stadium and left uh, Tika Town with three points. The one for K10 from Tika Stadium, I'm Hassan Juma. Thanks, Hassan. And Linda has forced me to say Guinea Waseka. Well, of course, the champagne is definitely on the ice for Gormahi. Now, in athletics, uh, Dennis Kimeto, who broke the course record in Chicago Marathon uh, on Sunday, has vowed to challenge Wilson Kipsang's record in the near future. Kimeto, who together with the women's race winner Rita Jepto arrived in Elred, says Kipsang's record may not last long. Kimeto won in Chicago in 2 hours, 3 minutes and 45 seconds, leading a 1-2-3 finish for Kenya. He beat the mark of 2 hours, 4 minutes and 38 seconds set by Ethiopia's Sagai Kebede last year. Jepto too said it is just a matter of time before a Kenyan female athlete breaks her world record. Kimeto's victory was the second in a major race. Jepto followed up her victory at Boston by easily taking the women's race in Chicago, finishing in 2 hours, 19 minutes and 57 seconds after losing in a sprint a year ago. I forced you. Mungu akinichalia inaweza kufunja rekodi lakini si yesi sema nitafunja wapi lakini Mungu anajua peke yake. Anaenda sasa kujiandaa ni fuli ya rekodi yake sasa. Now suspended football Kenya Federation officials Sami Shulei Lodvik Aduda and Hussein Terry pushed their wish to have the FKF national chairman investigated by the anti-corruption agency. The trio presented the incriminating evidence to integrity house and vowed to push on until justice is served of course we shall be bringing you the clips anytime now that is of course the controversy surrounding the football kenya Fed Fed football kenya federation officials where the three of them sami sholei aduda and hussein terry have pushed their wish to have the fkf national chairman uh, sam namoya investigated take a look last august calf with two hundred thousand dollars for a goal project is in it to make a vp's a person Kwa hivyo, ni jambo la kusikitika kwa mba mtu wadaweza kukwenda openly kudanganya wa Kenya. FIFA will never come into any case if they think, I mean, there is no um, 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 a case in, in the case that you're submitting. Right now, there is a case, but since we have submitted the case to ESCC, FIFA are actually waiting for the outcome from here. Let's end this bulletin across the borders and a cancer diagnosis and rapid decline in health push a man and a woman to quickly tie the knot. A CNN's Rose Cavett reports the couple said their vows in the back of an ambulance in Georgia. A story of two love bodies. Just ahead, what the hell? Let's now end this bulletin and let, before we do that, of course, we'll bring you a recap of the big Q. And tonight we are, it is all about politics. Remember tomorrow there are seven by-elections across the country. Tonight we are asking you, do you support the process used by the political party you support to choose the candidates in this by-election? Let's see how you have polled, Linda. It's right there on your screen. 41% of you say yes, 59% of you say no. One of the people who says no is Dave. And Dave says, I don't support it because it is done to favor those who sponsor the parties with cash. Let the truth be told. Michael Nguyenya says it's not called, it's called imposing candidates on voters. It's asking voters to rubber stamp preferences from above. Uh, Gignando says, I don't support it. Shortchanging the voters, let's give them a free hand to choose their leaders. James Okot says, no, 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 it's like forcing a child to drink sugarless porridge. It, is not, it, it cannot and should not happen in this day and age. Finally, Omwalo says, no political parties in Kenya are formed for business, so no democracy should be expected. Those are your opinions, and we thank you for tweeting us for being part of this bulletin. We'll see you tomorrow. Sleep well. I'm Linda Ogutu. And thanks for joining us on your most qualified news bulletin in town. I'm Ben Kitilia. Have a wonderful night. Jeff Konange Live begins shortly.